Andre Berto looks for IBF gold. This is what the fans want to see. The raging bull fights at home for the first time. And the UFC finally inks a deal with a major network. This is a major media deal at every level throughout the spectrum. This is Fight Network's preview show. It couldn't have worked out any, any better than this. Sarah Davis and you're watching Fight Network's preview show. Boxing analyst Corey Erdman will join me to break down the matchups that are set to take place from around the world this weekend in the Sweet Science. We'll also take a look at what the world's biggest MMA organization has been up to. But first, we're starting with a title fight between Andre Berto and Jan Zavik going down in Biloxi, Mississippi. Former WBC welterweight champion Andre Berto faces off against IBF welterweight champion Jan Zavik. Berto's only blemish on his record was suffered in his most recent bout when he lost his WBC welterweight title to Victor Ortiz in a unanimous decision. Zavik has a single loss on his record and is currently riding a six-fight winning streak. Hi, my name is Dejan Zavitz, in boxing known as Jan Zavik. All respect from Pac-Man, Mayweather, Koto, Berto, but gentlemen, I am also here. Former welterweight titleist Andre Berto will return to challenge title holder Jan Zavik of Slovenia. Zavik, who has fought all but one of his fights in Europe, will step out of his comfort zone when he leaves his homeland to fight in the United States for the very first time. The Slovenian looks to redeem himself after being criticized for not fighting higher class opponents and not looking especially convincing against any of them. Berto, in one of the most action-packed fights of the year, lost his 147-pound title by unanimous decision to Vic Ortiz. Looks to put his career back on track. Continue to motivate people, going to continue to inspire people, and uh, we're going to continue trying to tell our story. Zavik, the IBF welterweight champion, has held the title since 2009 and uses a European style to get the job done. He uses his height and reach to keep fighters at the end of his jab and utilizes this strategy to open up his power shots. He has shown that he is willing to stand and trade with anyone. Although the Slovenian's power is deceiving, with 18 KOs to his credit, Zavik can pack a punch. Conversely, Berto is fairly well-rounded with good solid punches and movement. Good counter right hand by Berto, catches the attention of Colazzo. Like Zavik, he is not afraid to stand and bang with opponents. If Berto forces the fight, we could see the young gun from the U.S. claim another title. Oh, down goes Rodriguez from one of those power shots. Both of these fighters have been criticized for not taking on the best opponents. Berto's past mismatches against lower class fighters have stunted his career. However, Savic is a legitimate welterweight, and while he may not have the name value in the States, it's at worst a more legitimate fight than many of Berto's past opponents. Zavik will be looking to impress the world on Saturday and hopefully make a name himself outside of Europe. Facing the best fighters in USA, was my long time challenge. I'm definitely ready to prove myself against Andre on September 3rd. Recovering from a tough loss is hard for any fighter, but it will be up to Berto to turn the tide and show the boxing world that he can reclaim his former glory as a legitimate champion of the world. Our boxing analyst, Corey Erdman. Corey, do you think Andre Berto is just fighting Jan Zavik for just another title shot? Or should he have gone back to Victor Ortiz for his WBC welterweight title? Well, that is Andre Berto's reputation, is taking that easy fight. And he's really been coddled along his entire career by Lou DiBella. And with those HBO paychecks coming in, getting a million dollars to fight nobody. So yeah, that's what Andre Berto's been that doing. That sounds all right to me. Yeah, and it has been. But now he is in a position where he has to take a tough fight. And make no mistake, Jan Zavik is absolutely a tough fight. He's not just a guy with a title. This is going to be a, a more difficult than usual style matchup for Berto and a credible opponent for the first time in a while. So Berto just suffered his first loss to Ortiz. Um, how does that affect a fighter and where do you think he was exposed in that fight? Well, we found out in the Ortiz fight, Sarah, that Andre Berto just isn't a very good boxer. We found out that he really has been getting along all along on athleticism, speed, and power, those natural gifts that he's had. But I'll tell you what was really exposed in that fight. It's Andre Berto's corner. Tony Morgan looked absolutely helpless in that fight when Andre Berto needed it the most. When he was hurt, Tony Morgan was trying to give him instruction, and instead, Andre Berto's brother and his friends were in the corner yelling at him, really giving him the, the type of instruction that you and I would get from our friends if we were to get in a street fight. Go get him, you're a warrior, go get him, Andre. That's not what he needs to hear. And for a fighter like Berto, who had never faced adversity before, there was no one there to give him any guidance. And I think that's where 
the first loss is probably going to be good, not only for Andre Birdo, but for his corner, because if they go back and look at that tape, they know that there are things that need to be changed in the background in Andre Birdo's career. And how do you think it's going to end? I think that Birdo's going to get himself a decision here. I don't think that he's going to be able to stop Zavik, because again, he doesn't get in trouble very often, but I do think that Zavik isn't quite active enough for a guy who likes to put the earmuffs up. He doesn't jab his way in, so he ends up standing flat-footed a lot. And if Birdo can pick those things up, again, if Tony Morgan in the Birdo corner could pick up on that and just tell him, Andre, throw your hands, I think he can get himself a unanimous decision victory. Three division world title holder Victor Chinian defends his IBO Bantamweight Championship against WBC International Super Flyweight Champion Evans Mbamba. In his most recent bout, Darchinian beat Yanni Perez for his current title and became the first boxer to win four different IBO titles. After his loss to Thomas Rojas in Mexico, Mbamba is coming off a win over Michael Raman Beletsa in his home country. Bantamweight Vic Darchinian will be stepping down in the level of competition he's used to fighting when he faces relative unknown Evans Mbamba in Armenia. This is a fight to keep Darchinian in shape after the Bantamweight tournament as he gets ready to move forward with his career and face the elite Bantamweights once again. I'm going to prove my point. I'm going to be ready. Anyone who's going to be in front of me. Mbaba has not faced the creme de la creme of the division and most of his opponents carry mediocre records. He will find himself very hard pressed to put on a good show when he steps up in competition to face the hard hitting and awkward moving Darchinian. Oh, what a left hand by Darchinian! The Bantamweight tournament to crown the division's best was held with four of the division's top fighters. Although Darchinian had a rough road through the Bantamweight tournament, he recently defeated Yanni Perez via fifth round stoppage last April to capture the IBO Bantamweight strap. Left hand by Darchinian, backs up Perez! He may have hurt him! Darchinian! Before that, the Armenian was outworked by Abner Mares in a 12 round split decision loss in December of 2010. Here's Abner Mares! Very close, letting his hands go. This last round could determine the outcome of the fight. Morris wins it by split decision. The Raging Bull needs to consider moving back down in weight to the super flyweight or flyweight divisions since he's not shown the same form as in past fights. Well, this is the worst nightmare for Jorge Arce. The doctor stepping in, saying that's it. With two losses prior to the tournament against natural bantamweights Nonito Denaire and Joseph Becco, Darchinian struggles against larger fighters. Although he's still among the best in the division, he is not competing on the same level as he has in the past, and he'll have to look spectacular against the unknown Mbamba. This fight will be very important to the career of both fighters. Mbamba must secure a win to rise in the bantamweight division and make a name for himself. Darchinian must impress to further his career in a division that he has been widely criticized for entering. Will the underdog be able to catch a bone this Saturday and upset the champ, or will the featherweight killer hush the barking and return to his previous form? At 35 years old, how many more fights do you think Darchinian has in his tank? Well, you know what? We've thought that Vic Darchinian has been done numerous times in his mm -hmm. career, but in the Abner Mares fight in the first round of the Showtime Bantamweight Tournament, he had a lot more life and a lot more energy than we thought he would, and a lot of people had that fight scored for Vic Darchinian. Vic is looking for those big fights still, and the fact that Vic is a little flaky when it comes to being in the boardroom, and he's balked at fights with Nonito Donaire several times in the past, and takes these fights in the interim, we could see Vic Darchinian fight another 10 times because he keeps adding these little fights to his resume. I think we'll see Vic in the ring uh, probably for another three years. And what sort of challenge does Mbamba pose for him? Well, Mbamba is a little bit awkward. He's sort of your, your typical African fighter. He's upright. Uh, he likes to switch stances occasionally, but if you look at the records, Mbamba was knocked down twice and lost a unanimous decision to Thomas Rojas. Thomas Rojas was knocked out by Vic Darchinian in two rounds, and it doesn't always work this way in boxing because, as always, styles make fights. But nonetheless, Rojas is sort of like Darchinian. He's a guy who likes to load up that left hand, and guess what? Mbamba got caught with it numerous times and again twice hit the canvas so I see this being a pretty easy night for Vic Darchinian. How do you think it's gonna end? <laughs> I do think that Mbaba will wind up getting himself knocked out unfortunately. Uh, I think that Vic is too relentless and Mbamba's foot speed is just dreadful. I think he's gonna get trapped in a corner at some point uh, and Vic's gonna land that big left or uh, a barrage of them and get him out of there. Former two-time world champion Umberto Zorita Soto rides a 12-fight winning streak as he enters a match with former WBA lightweight champion Jose Alfaro. Alfaro has only won five of his last nine bouts but has earned 22 of his fights by knockout. 
In pursuit of bigger fights and bigger paydays, lightweight champion Humberto Soto is moving up in weight to the light welterweight division to take on borderline contender Jose Alfaro in a 10-round bout. Soto is hoping to secure a money fight against Eric Morales in the near future. However, a fight with the Mexican warrior will not take place anytime soon as Morales is set to square off against Lucas Matias for the WBC light welterweight title on September 17th. He's also interested in avenging a loss to Marcus Maidana from last April. Soto is going to have a hard time competing in the light welterweight division as he has not looked impressive fighting smaller men. He had a hard time beating a small lightweight Nirvano Antion last December, which doesn't bode well for the Mexican as he gets ready to step up and face much larger and stronger fighters at 140. Soto is not hard to hit and doesn't have a large frame for the division, which will pose serious problems when he faces opponents with far greater physical strength than himself. If Soto plays his cards right, he should not have many problems dealing with Alfaro inside the ring. Soto should try and keep the pace high and get Alfaro out of there quickly. Soto has was hurt again. Knees yeah. buckling and down he goes for the third oh, time in the round. Oh, oh, oh. And Dave Johnson has stopped it. Soto has seemed to fade in the later rounds of the fight, and it will be up to Alfaro to keep pushing Soto in order to wear him down. Alfaro is a good, solid fighter, and he showed that he could handle himself inside of the ring when he faced Morales last year fight which many thought Alfaro should have won. It will be up to Alfaro to press the action and wear the crafty little fox down in order to secure a spot for himself next to the division's elite. Should Soto get the win, big money fights should come to fruition. Whether or not he will succeed is up for debate. After the break, we're previewing the first event for a Singapore-based MMA promotion, and we're bringing you all the details on the UFC's major deal with Fox. Uh, it gives me uh, a lot of butterflies. MMA organizations has popped up in Singapore and is holding their first event this weekend, which will feature some UFC veterans. John Ramdeen is breaking down the card for us. The One Fighting Championship takes place on September 3rd in the economic powerhouse country of Singapore. In the main event, 901 Filipino Wushu champion Edward Fuliang takes on Korean top team representative A Sol Kwan in a lightweight matchup. Kwan has been compared to Vanderlei Silva due to his almost reckless brawling style and it should provide fans with an entertaining night of action. And what promises to be an explosive welterweight encounter, Phil Baroni looks for a second straight victory when he is paired with former Cage Force champion Yoshiyuki Yoshida. With a record of 12 and 6, the Japanese fighter has an opportunity to re-establish his MMA career with a win over the seasoned former Pride star. If Baroni comes into the contest in tip-top form and ready to showcase his blazing hand speed and power, a return to the big stage may follow. Also in action, Henzo Gracie representative Gregor Gracie hopes to showcase his family's art when he meets Pancrase veteran Siak Mo Kim in a 170-pound bout. And former WBA world boxing champion Yodson N. Sityog Tong makes his professional mixed martial arts debut when he challenges Muay Thai champion Daniel Mashamaidi in bantamweight action. It all goes down at the Singapore Indoor Stadium on September 3rd. The time has finally come for one of the world's biggest MMA promotion companies to sign a deal with a network. Coming up next, we have all the details on the UFC Fox agreement, including what this partnership means for the UFC and Zufa. It's a move that has positioned Zufa in an untouchable spot as the world's largest combat sports promotion. The UFC's seven-year partnership, rumored to be worth up to $100 million a year with Fox, will bring mixed martial arts to a wider audience and accentuate awareness of the brand with the aid of cross-promotion. This partnership has allowed Fox to capitalize on the fastest growing sport in the world, and in turn the UFC's reputation as a legitimate sport will be solidified as it will air on a network that features some of the world's largest sporting events. At the end of the day, uh, Fox just felt like the right deal for us. In 2005, the Ultimate Fighter reality show on Spike TV was a major success for Zufa. In the spring of 2012, the show will move to FX, where it will reach a broader audience. The biggest uh, announcement for me that I think is exciting is Ultimate Fighter. I think that's it's going to, when they're going to be able to, live fights every week. It's a 13-week show now. It's going to be live fights every week. I think that's going to be crazy. 
In addition to the reality show, FX and partner station Fuel TV will become major portals for UFC programming, including countdown shows, primetime, Unleashed, as well as the best of Pride FC. We got everything we wanted. We got to do it the way that we wanted. We got to do it with the network we wanted to be on, and it, it just it couldn't have worked out any, any better than this. We expected eventually we'd get there. You know, it, it, it just, it just you know, with the Ultimate Fighter and everything, it's just, this is just the next step and, and, and getting the acceptance that we, we should have and, and do have now. And um, we're, we're, it's just it's ama it's an amazing uh, step in the sport. Aside from potential increase in viewership, working under the Fox family should optimize sponsorship opportunities for the promotion as well as its fighters. This could facilitate the move from niche MMA brands to major mainstream labels and as a result curb what is currently categorized as mixed martial arts culture. In addition, UFC fighters will have the opportunity to showcase their skills and personalities to a broader audience and inevitably earn the respect and credibility that other sports celebrities enjoy. MMA on network television has seen its fair share of success and failures. This is ridiculous. Gentlemen, we're on national television. Gentlemen. The UFC as a company has created a solid infrastructure with the necessary talent to experience a successful run. Look at the track record. The last six fights from pay-per-view to free fights on TV have been phenomenal. So we're going to continue that trend and, and take this thing to a whole nother level. It gives us the opportunity to perform on a bigger range of audience than we ever did before. We're not second class anymore. We're right up there with the MLB, uh, uh, NFL. Um, you know, we're, we're mainstream. We're focused on kicking some ass here on Fox. A new era under the Fox umbrella will commence on November 12th at the Honda Center in Anaheim. The same night Manny Pacquiao defends his WBO welterweight title against Juan Manuel Marquez. On that night, the UFC will present a one-hour special with two fights airing live will be the start of a new chapter not only for Zufa, but also for the development of mixed martial arts. Coming up, we'll bring you an in-depth recap of Bellator Fighting Championships action-packed summer series. In this case is true. Oh my God! This segment on the Fight Network is brought to you by The Ballroom, downtown Toronto's newest interactive entertainment center. Between seasons four and five, Bellator Fighting Championships held their inaugural three-part summer series over the last few months. And now we're taking a look back on the featherweight tournament and what's up next for the promotion. After crowning Patricio Pitbull Freite as the Bellator season four featherweight tournament winner, the Bellator Fighting Championships didn't take any time off for the summer, running three events as part of their featherweight tournament summer series. These eight new participants kicked off the quarterfinals at Bellator 46, which emanated from the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Hollywood, Florida. We open tonight with featherweight tournament quarterfinal number one, Adam Schindler versus Ronnie Mann. From what I've seen of Adam Schindler, I'm not really impressed with him. You know, I'm here to make him look like an amateur. There you go, the left hand. Schindler's in all sorts of trouble. He is hard, good hammer fist. He's in hammer fist. That is it. Jacob Debris versus Nazareno Malagari. I have that second chance, so now I'm, I'm here to be the champion. And there is the tap! And Nazareno Malagari is through to the semifinal round. Shemair De Silva Jr. versus Marlon Sandro. Step in right now, good right hand by Sandro. Good left hook. Marlon Sandro! Luis Palomino versus Pat Curran. I'm coming into this tournament to walk through everybody, and unfortunately for Luis Palomino, he's the first. It's a modified guillotine, both legs on his back. Got it, a tap! A Peruvian necktie versus the Peruvian Luis Palomino. In July, the promotion ventured north of the border for the first time, holding a show at Casino Rama in Aurelia, Ontario. Nazareno Malagari versus Marlon Sandro. Nazareno has a great submission game, but he doesn't have anything I haven't seen before. Oh, good, good right hand. Hand. Take down from Marlon Sandro. Marlon Sandro! Ronnie Mann versus Pat Curran. I'm one fight away from the final of this tournament. There's nothing that's going to stop me from getting it. Ronnie Mann has a tough chin, but I'm, I'm ready to test it. Big knee. Chuck oh, the left. left hand. Jump knee by Curran. Pat, Patty, my Curran. 
Mohegan Sun Arena in Uncasville, Connecticut played host to Bellator 48 for the featherweight finals, which pitted Season 2 lightweight tournament winner Pat Curran against former Sengoku featherweight champion Marlon Sandro. He's a very technical fighter, but his technique won't help him when I put my fist on his face. I feel that Marlon Sandro is definitely one of the best featherweights in the world. He's never been knocked out before, but I know if I land on his chin, he's going to go to sleep. I think in this case it's true. Oh my God! Sandro's in all sorts of trouble! Just like that! Finish. Curran wins the featherweight tournament and takes home the $100,000 prize and will now take on the winner of the title clash between champion Joe Warren and Patricio Pitbull Frete. Along with the tournament action, there were many other exciting highlights from this past summer. Straightening out the arm, there's the stoppage! I'd much rather be known as the Rico Retire as opposed to the Kimball Killer. Oh, good right here! TKO stoppage! I knew going in he was going to be trying a spinning back fist and like a dummy I walked right into a spinning back fist right off the bat. From this position. It's extremely tight. Referee Dan Mergliana taking a really He's in. No, 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 no. That's a hard one to take to the cup. The action doesn't stop here as Bellator's fifth season is set to kick off September 10th as Bellator 49 features quarterfinal action in the welterweight tournament. Featured on the card are season two welterweight tournament finalist Dan Hornbuckle, MFC welterweight champion Douglas Lima, and UFC veteran Ben Saunders. At Bellator 50, the middleweight tournament gets underway with the likes of season two middleweight winner Alexander Slomenko. Dream veteran Zell Galicic, and season two middleweight finalist Brian Baker. Finally, the Bantamweights take center stage at Bellator 51 as featherweight champion Joe Warren looks for a second tournament win in a field that also includes Wilson Hayes and former WEC Bantamweight champion Chase Beebe. All the action kicks off Saturday, September 10th at Caesars Atlantic City in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Thanks to Corey Erdman for breaking down the boxing. That'll be it for the show, but if you're looking for more news or updates, visit our website, fightnetwork.com, and don't forget, hit us up on Twitter. Our handle is at FightNet. On behalf of the Fight Network, I'd like to thank The Ballroom for having us in their space, and thank you for watching. Enjoy the fights this weekend. You're talking about Fox is the number one network in the, in the country the number one network in the country and have been for like seven or eight years. They have all the, uh, the top properties from Major League Baseball, NASCAR, NFL. They have, uh, you know, from Family Guy to all the programming on FX uh, to Fox Sports. It just, as far as, the, you know, a multi-platform deal, uh, I control my, my production li like, like I want to. Um, you know, this, this, this deal just worked out perfect.